Hey guys. So can you guys hear me? Hit me up with a yes. Hi. Hi everybody. So I started a little early so that um, I can make sure people had time to join. This is my first IG live, so I'm hoping it goes okay. If you guys can hear me, anybody who's on, hit me with a yes so that I know this is actually... Okay, thanks, Danielle. So we've got a couple more minutes. So I thought I'd let everybody um, take some time to join. Hi, Katie. Thanks, guys, for telling me. Olivia, what are you doing on here? <laughs> you need to learn about the boards? Oh, Eric, you're a doll. Thank you. This is my, like, you know, social isolation. I'm not showing you guys my grays because that's a mess. So we've got about three minutes before we start. I promise I'm gonna make this really efficient. My goal was, I know the AAD was canceled and I know that people depend on the AAD for board review. So I didn't want people to freak out because there's enough things to freak out about. And it was a good way to channel some energy. So I'm glad you guys are all joining, thanks. All right, so two minutes. So here's what we're gonna do for format today since it's my first one doing it for you guys. Um, for those of you joining, my name's Kavita Marawala. I am a Mohs surgeon on Long Island. I am fellowship trained and I also do a lot of general dermatology and also aesthetics. I have my own private practice. I happen to have written a primer in derm surgery, which I wrote a couple of years ago and hopefully some of you guys um, have been able to use for board studying. This IG Live is geared mainly towards derm residents, but of course, if you feel like listening, you certainly can. My goal is to do 20 questions, and for right now, I'll read them to you. Um, I'll show you some um, answer choices, or I'll tell you answer choices. Oh, Olivia, you're the best. No H. Galadari, no dancing here. <laughs> um, and then please interact. So if you know the answers, feel free to um, type them in. Um, if you don't know them, that's okay. We all learn from each other. And uh, definitely ask questions. Hopefully I can answer all of them. Oh, thanks, Cassie. I appreciate that. So I promise this won't be more than 30 minutes. Um, we're gonna go through 20 questions and then if you guys like it, then we'll do 20 more questions tomorrow night and the night after that and the night after that. Hey Allison, how's it going? All right, so it's eight o'clock on the dot. Oh, thanks for that. I do, um, I'm doing it so that you guys don't feel so super stressed. I know, sorry, no COVID questions. All right, guys, so here we go. Question number one, is everybody ready? The majority of patients with perineural invasion from cutaneous malignancies experience which of the following? Is it causalgia, numbness, pain, pruritus, or no symptoms. So again, your answer choices are causalgia, numbness, pain, pruritus, or no symptoms. And these are patients with perineural invasion from cutaneous malignancies. So we've got an answer for pain, some more answers for pain, one answer for no symptoms, no symptoms,
So I'm gonna give you guys a minute after each question to think about it. So, so far pain and no symptoms are the top two answers from you guys. Hassan, of course you're gonna heckle from Dubai. Really, dude? <laughs> okay, the question for those of you who came on just now, the majority of patients with perineural invasion from cutaneous malignancies experience which of the following? Causalgia, numbness, pain, pruritus, or no symptoms? The correct answer is no symptoms. So 60 to 70% of patients with perineural invasion are asymptomatic. Um, the remainder of them can have some sensory or motor complaints and they typically have poor prognosis. Numbness along the course of a nerve is also always highly suggestive of perineural invasion. So if patients complain about that, you do want to, you do want to understand that. And remember that if you were worried about a tumor that had perineural invasion and the patient comes in for follow up later and says that they're having numbness along a nerve root, that's something that you should still consider after the procedure MOS is done in an area, for example. For those of you who wanted to know what causalgia was, I'm getting right there. Um, so causalgia is intense burning pain and sensitivity to the slightest vibration or touch. So where you'll see causalgia is usually with re reflex sympathetic dystrophy or RSD. People will complain of that um, little bit of vibration or touch causing a lot of pain. All right, question number two. In a patient with a platelet disorder, the minimum allowable platelet count before performing surgery should be which of the following? So the minimum number of platelets you expect a person to have before you'll perform surgery safely. Is it A, 10,000, B, 50,000, C, 100,000, D, 150,000, or E, 200,000? So again, the question is, what is the minimum allowable platelet count before performing surgery? Is it 10, 50, 100, 150, or 200,000? Perfect. A lot of you are getting this one right. Awesome. So the answer is 50,000. And again, the question is asking you for the minimum. So when you are taking exams, make sure that you are reading the question stem carefully. So the general guideline is that at 10,000, you can get hemostasis without complicated conditions. But for those people who are undergoing surgical procedures, you want about 50,000. Um, at some institutions that varies, some people operate at 30,000, but again, um, where I am and where I trained and most people I know, they will not operate on the skin at less than 50,000. Hassan, I know you're trying to mess me up, cut it out. Okay, which of the following surgical preparatory solutions is contraindicated for use around the ear? Is it benzalkonium chloride? Is it chlorhexidine? hexachlorophen, isopropyl alcohol, or povidone iodine. So which one do you not want to use around the ear? Benzylconium chloride, chlorhexidine, hexachlorophene, isopropyl alcohol, or povidone iodine. Nice, you guys can't fool you guys. Perfect. So the correct answer is chlorhexidine. Remember that that's the one that causes keratitis or otitis. Um, isopropyl alcohol, the thing to remember about that is that it's flammable in the setting of cautery, so you always want to be careful. For povidone iodine, that can stain hair and clothing. You always want to make sure you wash it off after a procedure. And then for benzylconium chloride, that's the one that can be found in something really... Um, popular right now, which is Lysol, um, and it's a preservative in saline solution. It's not often used as an anesthetic, but that's one to know about right now. Okay, next question. Which of the following sutures is most easily removed after a wound has been closed with a running subcuticular technique? So which suture would you use for a running subcuticular? Is it nylon, polydioxinone, polyester, polypropylene, 
or silk. Yep, Dr. Maimon for contact derm from eye drops is that benzoclonium uh, benzo alcohol. Good job. So is it nylon, polydioxinone, polyester, polypropylene, or silk? Good. So you guys seem to be getting this one right. Hopefully you guys have done some running sub cues um, in residency so far. So that polypropylene is the one we use most commonly for a subcuticular stitch. Remember, it's a monofilament, not absorbable. So what do you need to know about proline? <laughs> the blue one, correct, Hassan. It has high tensile strength, um, minimal tissue reactivity, which is why we use it for sub-Qs, and it can be easily removed from tissue. Um, the disadvantages include that it's um, costly, um, and then it's high plasticity. So the reason we think about um, tensile strength and plasticity is when we are putting sutures in areas that can get edematous, you wanna keep that in mind. But proline is a common one used for a sub -Q stitch. Okay, so here's the next question. A patient tells you she is allergic to paraaminobenzoic acid. For an excision, you should be sure to use which of the following. So she's allergic to paraaminobenzoic acid or PABA. So you're gonna use benzocaine, procaine, lidocaine, tetracaine, or proparacaine. Dr. Marmory, you're here, yay! The boys are with Kabir downstairs. I did not suffocate my children to do an IG live. <laughs> Should I repeat the question? There's not a lot of answers coming through. So a patient tells you she is allergic to paraaminobenzoic acid. So which one should you use? Benzocaine, procaine, lidocaine, tetracaine, or proparacaine? Good. The answer is lidocaine. And why is that? Because remember, esters produce a met metabolic byproduct called PABA. So that can cause um, cross-reactivity and the allergy. So if somebody tells you they're PABA allergic, you never want to use an ester. Good one, Dr. Patti. <laughs> All right. A patient tells you she is allergic to lidocaine with epinephrine. She reports a rapid heartbeat when she had administered when she had it administered during a dental procedure. So she comes in now for a biopsy. What advice do you give the patient? This is not a true allergy to lidocaine. This is an allergy to lidocaine, so you recommend the use of prilocaine. This is an allergy to epinephrine, not the lidocaine. This is an allergy to lidocaine, so you recommend the use of tetracaine, or this is an allergy to all anesthetics, so you recommend the use of normal saline. Danny Yanny, I see your answer, good one. <laughs> Fake news. Good job, guys. So this is not a true allergy, right? So um, it's not an allergy to lidocaine. This is one of the side effects of Epi's accidentally injected and it gets a little bit in a vessel so you get that rapid heart rate. Now, what's tricky about that? You wanna ask the patient more questions because a rapid heart rate is a sign of allergy. However, in this case, she's not truly allergic to Lido and Epi. So you should give her some reassurance. Good job, uh, Jackie. Jackie Tenney, is that how I say your name? <laughs> All right. Which of the following anesthetics is a vasoconstrictor? Vasoconstrictor, guys. Lidocaine, mepivacaine, cocaine, tetracaine, or bupivacaine? Which one is a vasoconstrictor? Lidocaine, mepivacaine, Cocaine, tetracaine, or bupivacaine? 
DC Skin Doc, the Wisco Kid. I see you guys. <laughs> Correct, it's cocaine. So remember that all anesthetics except for cocaine are vasodilators. That's why we add the epinephrine. Oh, my brother's on here. What are you doing on here, Mr. Neurosurgeon? Okay, which of the following anesthetics is not advisable to use in a pregnant woman? Lidocaine, atidocaine, prilocaine, or bupivacaine. So you don't want to use this in a pregnant woman. Lidocaine, atidocaine, prilocaine, or bupivacaine. Oh, Dr. Marmo, you're being too kind. Oh, I did not know that you use cocaine for pituitary surgery. That's interesting. So not advisable to use in a pregnant woman. Lidocaine, atidocaine, prilocaine, or bupivacaine. Hey, Todd. All right, so remember the following, that bupivacaine and mepivacaine are category C. So you do not want to use that in pregnant women. You can use lidocaine, atidocaine, and prilocaine. So those are all pre pregnancy category B. Hey, Annie. All right, next question. I told you we were going to be efficient. I know, Annie, you did pass. Why are you doing this? <laughs> okay, so which of the following reduces injection pain? Is it cooling the anesthetic, adding sodium bicarb, drawing the anesthetic and then using it two days later, injecting quickly, or using a large bore needle? So I'll ask that one again. Ellen and Annie, I know you're just here for moral support, unlike Hassan who's heckling me and my brother who's being nice. Okay, which of the following reduces injection pain? Cooling the anesthetic, hey Kim, adding sodium bicarb, drawing the anesthetic and using it two days later, injecting quickly or using a large bore needle. Good, so you wanna add sodium bicarb, right? So when, if you are drawing up anesthetic, you don't wanna use it days later because freshly drawn anesthetic is always the least painful. But that's when you're doing um, both the epi and adding it to the lido. So basically all of our one to 200,000 lido with epi is already pre-drawn, so it's already kind of painful at baseline. So you wanna add some sodium bicarb and a one to 10 dilution. All right, next question. So today, you know, obviously you can see we're focusing on anesthetics. We're gonna do some instruments. And so every day I'm gonna to try to tackle a different topic. And these are the most likely, from my experience, to be things that are high yield for you guys for the boards. Um, which of the following has the longest duration with epinephrine? Is it lidocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, prilocaine, or benzocaine? So with epi, which has the longest duration? Lido, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, prilocaine, or benzocaine? Okay, guys, so the answer is bupivacaine. So remember, lidocaine has the fastest onset with epi. That's why we use it pretty much all the time. Bupivacaine has the longest duration with epi. Ropivacaine has the longest duration without epi. And then, obviously, um, the other two are not correct. Yes, for the long Mohs cases, that's correct. Oh, hey, Dr. Um, Anna Bertelli, I love watching you on IG. All right, here we go. Hey, Dr. Double Chin, whoop, whoop, for Long Island. Okay, which of the following requires occlusion for efficacy? Is it EMLA, LMX, BLT, which is the benzocaine, lidocaine, tetracaine mix that a lot of people use for um, aesthetics, tetracaine or topocaine? So which one requires occlusion? EMLA, 
LMX, BLT, tetracaine, or topicaine. All right, there's no fooling you guys. So it's Emla. And for those of you who thought that it could be LMX, remember, it is that crappy Emma, that it's a liposomal encapsulated lidocaine, so by definition does not require occlusion. Um, ME charge, I don't think so in my practical experience, but... Um, and remember that uh, the methoglobinemia is definitely a potential side effect. Okay. A patient undergoing a melanoma excision starts to complain of tingling around the mouth. So melanoma excision, tingling around the mouth. What is your next best step? Is it Trendelenburg? Is it observe them? Is it call 911? Is it administer epinephrine or give the patient water? So they're undergoing a melanoma excision. They start having tingling around the mouth. What do you do? Trendelenburg? Observe, call 911, administer epi, or give the patient water. So this is a really important thing for you guys to be very comfortable with. So this is early stage lidocaine toxicity. So at this stage, you can observe, but remember, hold your lido. No more lido at all. And so you always wanna keep in mind when you're doing big cases, your milligrams per kilogram, and if the patient's still bleeding or it's a really big case, what we do in my office is we start doing um, half strength. You really do wanna make sure that you're checking in with the patient regarding symptoms. So tingling around the mouth, first stage early, observe, hold your Lido. Okay. <laughs> You could also stare at them creepily. And yes, you should call your attending. All right. So a patient's on the fifth stage of a Mohs procedure for squame of the scalp. You start to notice a tremor of the patient's hands. What's your next best step? So now you're on a really big um, case. You're at your fifth stage. There's been lots of bleeding. You've been um, numbing to get that under control as part of your like hemostasis thing. So now the patient's hands are starting to shake a little bit. Do you put them in Trendelenburg? Do you observe them? Do you start chest compressions? Do you administer diazepam? Or do you give the patient water? Trendelenburg, observe, start chest compressions, administer diazepam, or give the patient water. Good job, guys. So there's two things you actually need to do. So this is the middle stage of lidotoxicity, and you should make sure that you know how to handle this stuff and make sure for all everybody who's talking about benzos and diazepam that you actually have some on hand if you are doing big cases. Um, and so you not only want to administer diazepam, but you want to maintain an airway. I agree. The double shot latte is probably also needed by the fifth stage of Mohs. Okay, um, so I'm gonna show you guys a picture. I hope this works. Okay, can you guys see this photo? Okay, so this blade is best used for which of the following? Excision of the face, IND of assist, excision of the eyelid, or excision on the back? Hey, Dr. Sadie. Yes, assuming your patient doesn't have liver disease. Thanks, Kim. Um, can you guys see it now? Can you see it now? Okay, so is it excision of the face, IND of assist, excision of the eyelid, or excision on the back? All right, good, so I'm showing you a picture of a 15 blade, 
And you can tell because it's one line going this way and then it almost looks like the number five underneath. That's how I remember it. So that's a 15 blade. Remember a 10 blade is gonna have a really wide scooping belly. So for that instrument, you can use, for that blade, you'll use that um, for excision of the face. And the reason that that's better is because, exactly, Dr. Marmer, you got it. Um, the larger 10 blade is bigger. It's got a more rounded belly. We tend to use that for thicker skin, like on the back. And then you may get a picture of something called a beaver blade, which is a very specialized blade that some people use for mows around the eyes. And that's B-E-A-V-E-R. Okay, next question. What is this instrument best used for? So it's scissors, but it's got this at the tip. Can everybody see it? So is it for cutting eyelid skin, cutting suture, blunt dissection, or sharp dissection? So here's your instrument. It's a type of scissor. And is it best for cutting eyelid skin, cutting suture, blunt dissection, or sharp dissection? Okay, so these answers are interesting because they're kind of all over the place. So the key thing to know about this instrument is these are O'Brien angled scissors. So these are actually, and the reason they're not Castro Viejos is because they don't have springs on them. So Castro Viejo is a type of um, a scissor that we use for eyelids, um, but this one does not have the spring, which you would see in a Castro Viejo. It's this angle part of it, and that's called an O'Brien. So um, O'Brien angled scissors are, uh, used for cutting suture. So this is a random, are you guys like already um, making plans for like bluffs and stuff and leaving me out? That's not nice. Okay, so <laughs> these are O'Brien angled scissors. It's really important that you know what different kinds of instruments look like. Cause remember on the board, they're not gonna ask you what gradles are used for, right? Like too simple, you gotta know that. So it's the one-off thing. So these are O'Brien angled. You shouldn't run with them like that, Galadari. Okay, next question. Which sterilization method causes dulling of instruments? Is it steam autoclave? Um, steam autoclave, dry oven, wet autoclave, or just regular washing? Which method causes dulling of instruments? Is it steam autoclave, dry oven? <laughs> um, I'm laughing at all of your responses right now. Um, regular washing or wet autoclave? Correct, it's steam autoclave. So steam autoclave is actually corrosive and can dull your sharp instruments, which is why um, we do send instruments out for servicing. Wet autoclave is not a thing. Um, other things include cold sterilization. And then washing um, with your brushes after you use instruments does not dull them. Um, dry ovens are used in large hospital systems. Okay, which antiseptic is most likely to cause allergic contact dermatitis? This is a, a gimme. Iodine, bisohex, chlorhexidine, hexachlorophen, or isopropyl alcohol? I know, Dr. Sadie, I didn't make toaster an option. <laughs> Okay, so which antiseptic is most likely to cause allergic contact dermatitis? Iodine, bisohex, chlorhexidine, hexachlorophen, or isopropyl alcohol? Good job, guys. So um, iodine is the correct answer. And remember that of those, chlorhexidine is one that can cause the keratitis, conjunctivitis, and otitis. All right, so I'm gonna show you another picture. You have to let me know if you guys can see this one. It's iodine is the correct answer. 
Okay, here is the picture. Which is the Adson forceps? Is it A, B, C, D, or E? Forget about F and G. Can you guys see it? Which one is the Adson forceps? Oop, better, sorry. A, B, C, D, or E? Perfect, guys, that's correct, it's A. Those are the adsins that we use in surgery. Okay, next picture. Pictures are a little hard doing it this way. Okay, well, here's the question too, but look at the picture. Can you guys see that picture? I know, because of the, the B and the D, sorry. I have to figure out a better way to do photos next time, Annie. Um, okay, so this is the picture. A 27-year-old man has the pruritic eruption shown three days after excision of skin cancer and layered closure. Which of the following is the most likely cause? Is it allergic contact dermatitis? And he didn't even tell you what he was using. <laughs> um, irritant dermatitis, recurrent skin cancer, suture reaction, or wound infection? Love you, Alan. Thanks for popping in. Oh my God, I love that your name is poison.iv and you said contact derm. That's amazing. Perfect. So this is allergic contact dermatitis. And how do you know that? Because of all of these sort of satellites around the area and also the timeline. So there's pustules. It's geometric. Remember that bacitracin and neosporin are some of the top two allergens, which is why we tell people to use just Vaseline. i got last photo for you. Itis, I like that. Okay, so here's the instrument. Can everybody see it? Okay, so what is the best use of this instrument? Is it hemostasis, holding towels, gripping assist, or a needle driver for 3 Vicryl? What is the best use of this instrument? Is it hemostasis? holding towels, gripping assist, or needle driver for 3 Vicryl. Okay, so a lot of people are saying towel or assist. So this is an Alice clamp. Um, it's actually very similar to a towel clamp, but the key thing is you have to look at the teeth, kind of how they curve at the bottom. So this is a great one to grip the top of a cyst when you do that little bit of skin excision. And um, it will help you grip the top of it so you can dissect around it. All right, guys. So that was my 20 questions um, at 20 o'clock. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll do this again tomorrow. I hope that it was helpful to you. If you have questions you want me to review or specific topics, I'm going to try to do, you know, segmented things. So today was predominantly instruments and um, anesthetics, a little bit about, um, you know, uh, autoclave and stuff like that. So tomorrow we'll pick a different topic and we'll keep going for the next 14 days. Practice your social distancing when you can. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope this helped. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> yeah, I let my kids out of the closet now, son. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow. Don't forget, same time. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Dr. Patti.
Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. I'm glad you tuned in. And thanks for spreading the word, by the way. All right, I'm going to turn it up when we get down to a, a critical number so you guys don't think I'm just hanging up on you. All right, guys, see you tomorrow.